thank you all for showing up for the second installment. So uh, the topic is again about dynamics of one-dimensional quantum systems, but in sort of a different limit, uh, which is strongly disordered systems, so-called many-body localization. But it turns out that those are also integrable in some sense, maybe different from what we're used to. They at least do have an infinite number of conservation laws, but they're of a different form than what we're used to before. And this was all realized fairly recently, um, maybe in the last five years or so. And the reason why it belongs here in an integrability conference, it turns out that thinking about these conserved charges is the right way to understand dynamics in the MBL phase. Um, and I'll try to convince you of that. So MBL is already a big area. It's rapidly moving and so on. I certainly can't cover everything going on in MBL in one lecture or one and a half lectures, but uh, at least the part that's focused on dynamics deep in the phase I think that we understand reasonably well. Uh, questions like the transition between ordinary diffusive behavior and many body localization, maybe we don't understand so well. So before I jump into MBL, I want to say a little bit about uh, a crash course on numerical methods where even if you never write code, uh, at least understanding some of the progress in density matrix normalization group and things like that, so-called tensor networks, is worth doing. And one reason why I want to do that is the key to understanding this class of methods is really entanglement, which is also a useful way to think about the MBL phase. Uh, so I don't think entanglement has been mentioned so far. I think it probably is part of the standard education in theoretical physics now, which it wasn't when I was a student. Uh, but I'll remind you of what it is, and then we'll jump into numerical methods and then MBL. Uh, and of course, as a prelude to MBL, Anderson localization, which means localization by disorder in non-interacting systems, that's been studied for a long time. There's already a Nobel Prize for it and so on. Uh, I'll just review that because really the key question we want to answer is once we accept that the many-body localized phase exists, and that's been rigorously shown in at least one model, how is it different from old-fashioned Anderson localization? And for that, entanglement and conserved quantities and how they interact is kind of the key. Um, so, I already gave you a clue to what I'm going to lead up to in my first lecture. I said that in Anderson localized phases, the dynamical picture is fairly simple. Particles move a distance of the localization length, and then the system doesn't evolve very more, very, very much more. Uh, but in many body localization, that's going to turn out uh, not to be right. There's a very long time, logarithmically slow dynamics that's kind of the signature of the MBL phase. So that's where we're going. Okay, so a lot of the calculations that we do in hard quantum systems, say, where we don't find a clever trick like quantum Monte Carlo are done with exact diagonalization, uh, which is robust. It's hard to make a mistake, but you can only do it for very small systems because if you figure out the size of the Hamiltonian matrix for, say, n spin half sites, it's 2 to the n by 2 to the n, which is enormous. Um, so it's still true that a lot of important work on problems like MBL is done with exact diagonalization, uh, but 20 sites is not always the thermodynamic limit, and that's one reason why there are big disagreements about the nature of the MBL transition and even when the transition is, uh, just because the systems are so small. So there are probably different ways of interpreting the exact diagonalization on small systems that would agree in the infinite system limit, but are very different at 20 sites, and there's not too much to do about it. Uh, but for some problems, there's a lot of progress in a different method. It was originally called density matrix for normalization group. That's still the most famous example. It, it, now we think of this as one example of matrix product state methods or tensor network methods. Uh, but they're all pretty similar in the kind of states they deal with. They construct those states and evolve them by slightly different means. So I won't talk about that. I'm just going to talk about what kind of state are these algorithms good for because it turns out they're good for states with only local entanglement. And that's what makes them so powerful, especially in one dimension, for a lot of the problems we care about. So for example, if you care about integrable models on a lattice, as I showed you last time, you can do some very nice checks of your analytic work with methods like this. So even if you're more on the analytic side, it's good to know uh, how checks might work or when you should bother your friend to try to check something for you. Uh, and this method uses entanglement in a pretty fundamental way, so let me start off with that. And as I said, even if you don't care about numerics, the entanglement will still be useful to understand MBL. Um, 
Ich habe schon krank gehabt. Okay. So, quick reminder. Uh, a nice thing about quantum mechanics is that if I've got two subsystems A and B, then I can take a basis for A and a basis for B and form product states. And those product states are a basis for the combined Hilbert space AB. Uh, in other words, any state in the combined Hilbert space AB can be written as a superposition of product states. But not every state is a product state. Um, so there is a fundamental difference between something like this state, so I'm thinking about two spin-half spins, or qubits, uh, and I'm not going to worry about fermionic statistics or anything. Let's just keep life simple. So this is a state that is a product of a wave function for A and a wave function for B. So if I took that state and asked you, what is the wave function for part A, you'd have a well-defined answer. It's up. You could worry about the phase, but that's not really measurable. So what about the singlet? Uh, so the singlet is about the simplest example of a state that is a perfectly fine, pure quantum state when I look at the whole system. But if I ask you, uh, what is the wave function for spin A, um, there isn't a very good answer to that. Uh, in fact, the only description we can have for spin A is not a pure state, it's a mixed state or a density matrix. And this is the idea of entanglement, which I think either Schrodinger or Pauli summarized as we think this is a perfect description, or as perfect as quantum mechanics allows for the state of the whole system. If I had a perfect description of a classical gas, like if I knew where every particle of the gas was in the room, then if I looked at part of the system, I would also have a perfect description of that part. But that's not true in quantum mechanics. Uh, you may have a perfect description of the singlet, but if you just look at one of the spins, you can't really have a pure state maximal description of that. Uh, what you have instead is a density matrix. Uh, in other words, it's like I flipped a coin and didn't show you whether it was up or down. You would assign that probability half to be up and probability half to be down. This is not a pure state. If I were to put, for example, one half in place of zero here and here, that would be a pure state. That would be a state that is just aligned along a different axis than z. Okay, it is working. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the situation here is that there's really an entropy. Uh, I'll define entropy in a second, but you can believe that this has one bit of entropy, like a coin flip. And if you want to know how did I get the reduced density matrix, I did the partial trace over subsystem B. And one, so here's the formal definition. Uh, if I want to construct the reduced density matrix for subsystem A. Uh, maybe it's easiest to think about the matrix elements of that between two basis states of A. So let's say phi are basis states for part A and psi are basis states for part B. Then uh, if this is my pure state of the whole thing, I form this combination, which is basically summing over a basis of B. That's why we call it the partial trace over B. And what matrix element I'm computing is determined by phi 1 and phi 2. Anyway, so this object uh, is a density matrix and I form its entropy. So this is von Neumann's definition of the entropy of a density matrix. And that's what we call entanglement entropy. And entanglement entropy is harder to define if you're at non-zero temperature or if you're interested in a system with three parts or so on. But there's no ambiguity about the bipartite entanglement entropy of a system with two parts. And it's physical, this reduced density matrix, uh, because anything I can measure that's just on subsystem A will be given by a trace of the local operator with this reduced density matrix, a partial density matrix. So that makes an interesting point, which is if you're just looking at a piece of the system and you realize there's some entropy, you can't really tell if that's physical entropy because the whole world, the larger system, is in a mixed state or whether the larger system is in a pure state and you're just generating some entropy by only looking at a piece of it, that's not a physically distinguishable question if you only have the subsystem. So the way local Hamiltonians work to generate entanglement is going to be a clue to why these numerical methods are valuable and to, a way to tell apart different kinds of states. So this has been sort of a growth industry in quantum condensed matter computing the entanglement of various states. Uh, I want to think about simple states to start with, and then about 1 plus 1d CFTs. So 
think about states that I could write as combinations of singlets. Um, so one singlet, I just told you, produces one bit of entropy. Uh, if I took so-called valence bond states, and let me just think about static ones, so something where the dimers or singlets are short-ranged, if I were to make a partition of the system into A and B and ask what's the entanglement entropy, I would just get the number of singlets crossing the boundary. And if the singlets are all small like this, if they're all local, that will scale as the size of the boundary times some length scale related to the size of the singlet. In other words, it goes as the size of the boundary, not the volume of the system. Uh, that's the so-called area law. Um, if I've got longer range singlets like here, then more complicated things could happen. So I don't always get area law. And we'll talk about how critical states in 1D are not area law states. But a state like this, with, which has no long distance physics, tends to be area law. Um, so in more formal terms, if I've got my d-dimensional system, and I make a subregion A of linear size L, and let's say that I've cut that out of an infinitely large, or at least much larger, whole system. Uh, I can ask, how should the entanglement scale with L? And the simplest argument for why the area law is kind of a natural thing, if you don't want to draw singlets or something, is the following. I don't know if I emphasized this before. A nice thing about computing entanglement entropy of pure states is that you get the same answer whether you trace over A to get row B or whether you trace over B to get, get row A. The entanglement is really not a property of A or B, it's a joint property of the boundary or of A and B, a uh, property of the partition, I should say. And then the easiest thing that A and B share is the boundary, so maybe the entanglement should go like the size of the boundary, that's the area law. And there should be one more maybe length scale in it, which is something like a correlation length or a singlet size or whatever. So this is uh, not a law in the sense of something that always applies, but it's one kind of scaling law that applies in a lot of systems. And it turns out that the matrix product state representations that are kind of the key for these newish numerical methods work very well, and provably so, for states that satisfy area laws. Um, so if I had no notion of a local Hamiltonian, if everything was arbitrarily likely to be entangled with a faraway site, then I would get a volume law, S going as L to the D. And it turns out that uh, when we think about states and condensed matter, we'll find that many systems have ground states that are area law, but if I look at states of finite energy density, they tend to be volume law, but MBL states are an exception to that usual picture. Um, if you want to know why would we expect most states with non-zero energy density to be volume law, that's because of what I told you before uh, about entropy and about something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is the idea that if you look at a typical state of a chaotic quantum system, then locally that state should look thermal. There's a complicated set of arguments that lead you to why we believe this is true, but it's still just a hypothesis. So if one quantum state is going to look thermal, if I only look at part of it, then that means that its entanglement entropy of that little region has to match the thermal entropy, if it's going to look thermal. And if it's going to match the thermal entropy, well, thermal entropies go like volumes. So for a state to satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and to be at non-zero energy density, which means non-zero temperature, it had better be volume law. Uh, sorry if that was a little quick. You can ask me later on when I, when I use that for something. So let's do a one-dimensional example and see how quantum criticality violates the area law in 1D. Um, so let's think about the kind of systems I talked about yesterday to start with, translation invariant local one-dimensional Hamiltonians. Uh, and let's make a simple partition where A is some contiguous set of endpoints and B is everything else. So if I'm away from a critical point, then the meaning of the area law in one dimension is very simple. It means that even as I make this small region larger and larger, I find that the entanglement entropy doesn't keep growing, it saturates at some constant, uh, because the area the, of the boundary in 1D is just finite, order one. So what about quantum critical states, like for example metals, one-dimensional fermions, uh, how do things change? Um, and the answer is there's a, a set of different approaches that all give the same quite beautiful answer, and 
I won't get into them, uh, but I'll just tell you the result. If I look at a simple quantum critical ground state, let's say described by a conformal field theory, one example would be the Heisenberg antiferromagnet, the problem that Betha solved to invent the Betha ansatz. Then this violates the area law because the entanglement of the subregion goes as the logarithm of the size of the subregion. And this is true for one dimensional conformal field theories, uh, for quantum critical points in 1D described by 2D CFTs, if you want to be precise. And the coefficient of the divergence is always the central charge of the CFT. So central charge basically counts the number of gapless degrees of freedom in units where a free boson or a free Dirac fermion is one. Uh, so this problem has uh, C equal to one. So that's nice. It means that just by looking at the ground state wave function in the right way, I can measure the central charge. In the past, people knew that if you measured the specific heat, for example, that would give you a measurement of central charge, but that requires going this small non-zero temperature. This is saying that hidden within the ground state and its entanglement is the most important property of the field theory description. Um, so this is what I was saying about uh, how central charge appears in other things. So this is the statement about the free energy. I'll come back to this in lecture three because one-dimensional metals of electrons, say, uh, turn out at low energy all well to be described by the same conformal field theory, and yet they can be very different in their transport properties and so on because they're actually controlled by the irrelevant perturbations to the CFT. Um, so for now, uh, let's just assume that entanglement entropy counts states, in a sense, consistent with specific heat. Uh, even if you make random, the random version of the spin chain actually has a similar logarithmic scaling, uh, but we don't really know above one dimension especially, we don't know everything yet about entanglement entropy scaling and so on, but what I want to try to convince you now is how does this give us a clue to make an efficient classical computational description of quantum states, and that description will work very well for area law states, and I'll try to convince you it works pretty well for gapless states at least in 1D as well, because for the simulations that I showed you in the previous lecture, that was one-dimensional states at non-zero temperature doing quantum dynamics and so on. Uh, so the rough concept that I will make more precise as we go along is that entanglement entropy basically tells you how much classical information do you need to write down a quantum state. So states that aren't entangled are very simple to work with. They require very little classical information. They just don't capture most of the physics that we care about. So for example, Yes. Um, yeah, that, that is an interesting So if I gave you a quantum state and you didn't know anything about locality of the Hamiltonian, then I could have two totally different Hamiltonians that just happen to have the same ground state. If you impose locality, then you no longer have quite that much freedom. Uh, there's some work, I think, by Tarun Grover recently on trying to isolate how much does knowing the ground state tell you about the Hamiltonian. So, for example, some folklore, which is not always true, but it's always true in one direction, is that if you've got a state with power law correlations, then it's gapless. And if you've got a state with exponentially short correlations, then it's gapped. Uh, so that's an example where some correlation in the ground state does actually tell you if you have local Hamiltonians, information about the spectrum, and this is kind of like that. Uh, but there definitely, yeah, so there's an assumption there, and how to make this precise is a lot of work, that we are not just thinking of the Hamiltonian as a general Hermitian matrix, but as something that is local in space. If, if it was a general Hermitian matrix, then you're right, all bets would be off, and just knowing the ground state wouldn't tell you anything. Yeah, so good question. So uh, if we're thinking about a product state, then it only takes linear information in the system size to write down a product state. So let's say I'm thinking about n spins. Uh, I've cheated here. I've assumed that the product state is the same, that the wave function is the same on every spin. Product state just means well-defined wave function for every spin. If I want translation and variance, I can make them all the same. If I let them be different, then it will take me something like 2n coefficients to write down a product state which would be great because, you know, all the trouble we run into with exact diagonalization is that we have to deal with two to the n numbers. So if you only had to deal with two n numbers, life would be simple. The problem is we would lose all of our interesting correlation physics and stuff like that. So the lesson of the area law 
the fact that many of the states we care about, especially for ground states, have an area law is that we need to do better than this, but we don't need to do the full Hilbert space. And that's basically what matrix product states do. Um, and the explicit writing down of a matrix product state, here's an example. All I want to do um, is add a bunch of upper indices. So the history is that Steve White from UC Irvine came up with this great algorithm. And then Austin and Romer kind of explained in general terms what sort of state it's making. Um, I'm going to add some upper indices that are not directly physical. Uh, they run from, say, one up to some number called the bond dimension that is just set by how much memory I want to use on my computer, how much time I have. So those tensors now, uh, we can write it as sort of a network of tensors where you'll note that the same index J appears here as there, K there, and I'm going to trace over all the upper indices and the lower indices I use to figure out the overall coefficient of some particular quantum state. So how many numbers does this require? Well, for each site, it requires the bond dimension squared, maybe, times 2, if I've got local Hilbert space of 2. Um, and how much that is? Well, if I set bond dimension equal to 1, I'd be back to product states. In practice, we sometimes deal with bond dimensions of up to 1,000 or so. That would be extremely large. Uh, but you'll see in a moment that these states can converge to the true ground state, or maybe more precisely, they can reproduce the values of operators in the true ground state in some problems very rapidly, even for small bond dimension. And now, if you read the archive, you've probably noticed all kinds of much more complicated tensor networks that this would just be like a chain. There are some that are more hierarchical and so on, so it's a growing field, but even the old-fashioned DMRG-type tensor network is good enough for a lot of things in 1D. Um, so, in the early days of DMRG uh, and matrix product states, there were things that people thought were hard, but then in the 20 plus years, more than that, since White's work, we now know uh, ways to get around some of the difficulties. So, I'll tell you a couple of the tricks and I'll go through one in detail because it's about entanglement and it relates to uh, this idea of quantum critical systems being harder. So. One idea that is kind of neat is so-called infinite system methods. So normally, when you want to study an infinite system, uh, you study a large finite system, and you try to make the system larger and larger until you achieve the largest you can. And there's a whole theory of so-called finite size scaling for how do you converge to a thermodynamic limit critical point when you have finite size. Finite size basically acts like a perturbation that moves you slightly away from criticality. There's something else you can do here, which is suppose you know or believe or want to look for translation invariant states, then you could just impose that all these tensors are the same, and then you really only have to work with one tensor. Usually you work with two tensors for numerical convenience, but uh, that means you can study the infinite system with just two tensors. So where's the approximation? Well, it's in the size of the matrix. Uh, in order to faithfully capture all the entanglement of the infinite system at criticality, say, you'd need the bond dimension to be infinite. And how that works is going to be the subject of the next couple of slides. Uh, but just to say where our understanding of these methods has evolved, uh, we used to think that finite size was the best. It's still the best for some things, but not for criticality, say. We used to think that gapless systems were hard. Uh, they're not too hard. Dynamics are possible, finite temperature is possible, so at least if you're in low enough spatial dimension and you have local problems, this is a fairly powerful method. Um, so here's a simple example. If you actually want to try to write a version of this algorithm, the simplest is in this PRL by Gifre Vidal. With about one page of code, you can reproduce this calculation if you want. Um, if you take the transverse Ising model, which we know is solvable in terms of Majorana fermions, this has a quantum critical point when g is equal to j. Uh, that is a c equal to one half quantum critical point described by a free Majorana fermion. But anyway, we know the exact energy and so on. So if we look at tensor networks of small bond dimension and ask how does the energy converge to the theoretically known energy as the bond dimension increases, you can see it gets extremely small if you're away from the critical point. So even if you're just 5% away from the critical point, uh, your error is something like 10 to the minus 10 by the time your bond dimension is 16. So that's basically two 16 by 16 matrices, which is not really exhausting for even a laptop. 
If you're at the critical point, though, you can see that something special is happening right at the critical point. You don't converge nearly as rapidly, and that is because there's more entanglement here in a qualitative way. Uh, but even that we now understand, at least for 1D CFTs, and I'll show you how uh, we know that. So the idea is that when you work with the translation invariant methods, uh, finite matrix size replaces what used to be finite size scaling. This is called finite entanglement scaling. It's basically the statement that if you are forced to work on a quantum critical point, but with finite matrices, then you basically push your system a tiny bit away from criticality, the same way that finite size pushes a system away from criticality. And how far you push it away is like the bond dimension, or I should say the induced correlation length, is like the bond dimension to some power kappa. And this was kind of an observation. Uh, and it turns out that you can develop a simple theory of what kappa is that works pretty well. It's kind of an ansatz, but it fits the data that are out there uh, using a result that I'll tell you about by others on the entanglement spectrum. So, but the main lesson from a qualitative point of view is that finite matrix dimension or finite entanglement is like finite size. It pushes you a bit away from criticality, but in a controlled way. Um, so now is a good time to understand how this works. To, I said that this is all connected to entanglement. Let's do that in a bit more detail. Um, so if I'm thinking about the entanglement of a state in a more practical way, uh, if you give me any pure state of the bipartite system, then I can expand it over product states in some basis A and B. And then by acting with unitary matrices, basically by changing basis on the two subsystems, I can make all the coefficients in this expansion positive uh, or non-negative real numbers. Uh, and the Schmidt rank is the number of these that have to be non-zero. So for example, a product state, the first one of these is one and all the others are zero. Uh, at a critical state, this distribution has a very long tail, but that was actually worked out, at least for some cases, by Calabrese and Lefebvre. And I'll show you something about their formula in a second. But the way this is related to the entanglement I talked about before, once you know these so-called Schmidt eigenvalues, their squares are basically probabilities. The entanglement entropy is just the sum of lambda squared log lambda squared. Um, so what representing a quantum state by a matrix product state does is kind of like compression. Uh, you can't keep all the information about the state. You basically form, you should think of the way this is working as you form the Schmidt decomposition, but then you only kept the largest chi eigenvalues. Uh, because if I were to take my matrix product state of finite dimension and do this process, I would find that at most the bond dimension chi of these Schmidt eigenvalues can be non-zero. Uh, so basically I truncated the others and then I renormalized the first bunch and that's how the algorithm keeps on working with matrices of finite size. Uh, and you might ask, well, what does that look like or how does that work in practice? And Frank Pullman, who used to be a postdoc of mine, he's now in Munich, uh, wanted to make a picture of what's going on. So we're taking a matrix, specifically this matrix C, and only keeping the largest singular value decomposition eigenvalues of it. That's actually a well-known process in other fields. For example, in image processing, a grayscale image uh, is a matrix where I and J are like X and Y coordinates, and the magnitude is the color. So you can try applying this same step to images. Uh, so he took a picture, and if you only keep the lowest four eigenvalues in the singular value decomposition, uh, it doesn't look very good. If you keep 16, it starts to look like a bridge. If you keep 64 or 256, it starts to look like a particular bridge. Uh, you're used to seeing it in orange, probably. This is our San Francisco bridge that we're proud of, the Golden Gate. Uh, but the point is, this is kind of what we're doing with quantum states. So as you increase the bond dimension, you do get a much better picture of what the physics is, at least if the state is complicated. It turns out that there are some famous states where even chi equal to four would be enough. So if you want an exercise, if you're a quantum condensed matter person, take the famous AKLT state of spin one, Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, Tasaki, the state that's a, an example of the Haldane gap, and figure out a matrix product state representation of it. And if you, need, if you need big matrices, you're doing something wrong. There's the hint. So that's a state that is actually a matrix product state in hindsight.
Okay, so now the way to understand what happens to a quantum critical point when you hit it with this truncation because you only have a finite computer size, well, I mentioned this work by Calabresi et al. They have a particular form involving a Bessel function for what is the spectrum of Schmidt eigenvalues at a 1D quantum critical point where B is related to central charge. Uh, and as you perturb away to keep things from being pathological, uh, you get a flatter and flatter distribution as you get closer to the critical point. So once you have this guess, and this is exact in some cases and pretty good in others, uh, you can truncate that and figure out what is kappa. And that's what we did, and you get this odd-looking formula, uh, but it's been checked a lot more by this group for a bunch of quantum critical points. It basically says that large central charge makes it harder, but not that much harder. You always get the same power law scaling where kappa is this finite entanglement scaling exponent. So I think rather than say more about this, it's better just to show you that it works. Um, so here's an example of a famous correlator. Um, these are equal time correlation functions in the ground state of the XXZ spin chain. And Lukyanov and Teres had computed both the leading asymptotic behavior and the subleading part, and I think even the third part. I don't know if we tried to get the third part, but basically this is as a function of the distance between two sites, what's the correlator, and these are the leading and subleading falling off, uh, and you can see the field theory and the numerics agree very well. You can convert that to a momentum distribution problem. Um, so then what this is about is a famous signature of Luttinger liquids. Luttinger liquids will appear a bit in lecture three. Uh, so if I look at a Fermi liquid, which we think is the right state of electrons in d equal to two or d equal to three, one of the divining features of a Fermi liquid is that the occupancy, the momentum distribution n of k, has a step function across the Fermi level. It may not be a step function of magnitude one, the magnitude gets renormalized, but it's always a step. In 1D, you have something different. You have a cusp-like singularity, and that you can also pull out from the numerics. Um, so that was all ground states. Yesterday, I showed you dynamics. There are various tricks, and in particular, Christoph Karish and Jens Bardersen put a lot of time into finding clever tricks to do dynamics with these methods, and I please ask me at T or something if you want to know more. Uh, I won't get into them here, but what they did was really important to figure out to basically enable the kind of calculations that I showed yesterday. So that's about what I wanted to say for numerics. Um, and I want to give kind of an overview of many body localization and how it relates to integrability. So maybe before I go on, uh, if you have questions about either entanglement or DMRG, please fire away because now we're going to change gears and talk about Anderson localization a bit for background and then get into MBL where this kind of method is useful. So if you don't ask me any questions, I'll assume that you, you know what you want to know about numerical methods. Oh. Well, I think the crossover is uh, it's about an order of limits. So if you're at finite energy density above the ground state, so in other words, your energy per volume is non-zero, then I think you will get volume law in a thermalizing state, not in an MBL state, but in, in a thermalizing state, that's right. Uh, the only states that are area law are energy over volume, uh, that is excitation energy over volume going to zero. So for example, if I've got a finite number of excitations over the ground state, that will still be area law. But if I've got a finite density per volume, that will be volume law. So it's sort of, uh, you have to take the zero carefully, that it's energy over volume. Um, so yeah, and a way to estimate it, you should get, if you believe in eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, you should get the entropy that corresponds to the temperature that corresponds to the energy density over the ground state that you put in. So there's even a numerical prediction. And yeah. Uh, that's right. It, it, this is information on the uh, distribution of the. Uh, it's the it, okay. So it's the, the number. The, the way it's formulated is it's the. Sorry if I went too quickly. Uh, the number of Schmidt eigenvalues that are greater than a number lambda that you give me. Uh, so that is to say, there, there's a there's a largest lambda, then a second largest lambda, then a third largest lambda, and so on. There's kind of a tail. They're decreasing. Uh, so this uh, Bessel function tells me how it decreases, and, and B is some parameter that comes from the central charge, basically. <laughs>
So the, the tricky thing is, strictly speaking, if you were at, if you're right at criticality where psi is infinity, it would be sort of infinitely flat and it's hard to write a meaningful formula. So you, you sort of, if you perturb away a little bit, uh, how flat the tail is, it becomes flatter as you move closer to criticality in this kind of controlled way. And I think this is exact for free fermions, for example. Yeah, I think they, my recollection is that they calculated it for free cases and saw that it worked very well in other cases. I don't think it has, okay, I could be wrong, uh, unless some, something might have happened in the intervening years, but I don't think it has a sort of universal CFT derivation the way that, for example, the logarithmic entanglement entropy at criticality does. Like, I don't think there's any way to put in twist operators or something clever and get this formula. So I kind of, I, I also, I would say I regard this as probably mostly right, but not exactly right, uh, which is why I regard this as maybe mostly right, but not exactly right. Uh, because I think, if I recall, I think you can find quantum critical points where the shape looks a lot like this, but it doesn't look like it's exactly converging to that. So I think, the, as far as I know, the precise entanglement spectrum for a general CFT is not known. Uh, well, well, B is not really free. I mean, okay. Uh, the central charge is fixed. And then this, I, I don't know if I think of that as a parameter, really. It's kind of uh, how, far you've, how far you are away from the critical point. Um, like, I, that, 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 that is independently measurable, I guess is the way to put it. Um, Okay, good. Other, uh, yes? Um, well, there are different people who use them. They're both good. Uh, I'll put it this way. I, I think TEBD is conceptually simpler in some ways. So if you're just going to sit down and write a code to make sure that you understand the idea, I would recommend TEBD. Uh, maybe for dynamics also. I think for... but. Many of the really precise ground state calculations are still done with DMRG. I mean, if, if you want to know the basic difference, um, TEBD is easily written as kind of a translation invariant set of operators that, or, or evolution processes on the state. Well, DMRG is based on this old Wilson numerical renormalization group idea where basically you have a piece of the system and you keep adding chunks on and then solving the chunk that you add on. But now there is an infinite, ver, infinite system version of DMRG that's a bit more like TBD. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's easy to say that one is better than the other. I don't even think it's clear which problems are better for one than for the other. Um, even that I'm not sure of. Uh, I, I, I think for... Dynamical evolution in MBL, I think that TEBD is better. Um, even for trying to, okay, so what, what's kind of a holy grail, a hard problem that people have not yet succeeded in, how, how can you isolate an individual excited state? And there, uh, people are still using TEBD for that, So when you might have thought that DMRG would be better. So I, I don't think it's very, I don't know if there is an answer to which one's better for that problem, I don't know. Well, let me, I mean, like, there are certainly MBL states that satisfy area law at non-zero energy density, but so, so what is the, what kind of state are you? Okay. Look forward to it. Other questions? All right. So let's talk about MBL. Um, so I... I I'm going to focus on a couple of questions. Uh, I'll give the prehistory, but these are just the references to stuff that we worked on. Um, so this will, this kind of thing will appear toward the end, maybe. But I, questions you might think about: How is this many-body localized phase that I'm going to talk about different from ordinary Anderson localization? And then I'm first going to talk about that in terms of entanglement, uh, and then how can you actually measure it, maybe? Um, and then something where I don't think we have the full answers yet. There is a notion of integrability, infinite number of conserved charges, and so on in MBL-type systems, but it seems very different from Yang-Baxter-type integrability that I talked about at the beginning yesterday. I don't think we fully understand what's the same and what's different yet. 
Um, and yeah, I'm going to skip, I think, everything above d equal to 1 and lots of other, you know, how does MBL interact with symmetry breaking or topological order, some kinds of quenches, etc. And theories of the transition in particular are very active and very hard. Okay, so the good news is we can still say some interesting things that I'm pretty confident are true. If we think about a system moving, an electron moving in a random potential, there's already something very surprising in that, that if you haven't heard about, uh, is pretty neat. So if you just took undergrad quantum mechanics and you thought about an electron in a random potential, say Schrodinger equation with some V of X, then you would guess that at low energy, maybe I have bound states in some minimum of the potential. While at high energy, I'll still notice the potential, but I'll scatter off of it. I'll have something like a scattering state, a combination of plane waves, roughly, but not a bound state that falls off exponentially. Um, so in three dimensions, this picture is basically right for non-interacting electrons. Uh, depends on the details of the symmetries of the potential and so on, but you often have, say, bound states at low energy, extended states at high energy, and some mobility edge energy in between. Um, if you're wondering, why does there have to be a transition as a function of energy? Why don't I just have localized and extended states all mixed in together? There's a famous argument by Mott that you might be able to do that for one particular disorder realization. Say, maybe you could find a random potential where you had an extended state and a localized state at the same energy, but if you make any small perturbation, those two states will mix strongly because the energy denominator is zero, so you'll immediately get two extended states. So in a sense, only for some measure zero set of potentials do you have localized and extended states at the same energy. Usually you have regions of localized states and then regions of extended states. Whether mobility edges exist in MBL systems is currently a subject of debate. There are claims that this doesn't happen, actually, in MBL, uh, looking ahead a bit. Instead, you have either all states localized or all states extended. That's what the mathematical physicists say. The numerical physicists who have worked on this tend to say, uh, sure, there's a mobility edge. We see it in our system of 20 sites. So probably the mathematical physicists are right, and the systems are not large enough, but uh, who knows? I, I won't talk about that more here, I think. So. If you're in one dimension or two dimensions, something very dramatic happens, which is all the electronic states wind up being localized. They might be localized with a very long length scale. So my definition of localization is roughly that there's some center such that far away from that center, the state amplitude falls off exponentially. Um, so if you're wondering why two dimensions is special for localization, let me at least give you an argument that a weak potential wouldn't be able to localize everything in 3D or in 2 plus epsilon dimensions. So what's special about 2D? Well, a scattering state, a semi-classical picture of a scattering state, this is an electron moving through my potential and bouncing off of things and getting scattered. Let's say it's basically like a random walk. If I'm doing a random walk in 3D, the number of times I ever come back to any particular spot, such as the origin, is finite. Uh, which means that if the potential bumps were weak and I only visit any bump a finite number of times, whatever quantum interference there is, is not going to localize me. Um, but in 2D and 1D, and this is a good exercise, show that a random walk returns to the origin infinitely often. In 2D, it's only logarithmic in the number of steps, so not a very strong infinity. In 1D, it's stronger. Uh, and that means that it's at least possible that if the sign of interference was in the right direction, that if you've got weak bumps in the potential, but you visit them infinitely often, then maybe you get localized by interference. And that does actually happen, uh, which contributed to the Nobel Prize for Anderson and Mott. Um, so I won't review the theory of non-interacting localization because the details of it are not very important for MBL in 1D. So just assume that I can make some kinds of disorder, like, for example, random on-site potentials that will localize all states in 1D. Yes. I, I will, yes. I, you, you can have states that are critical and fall off as a power law, but I, I don't think I'll need those. Well, even in 1D, so for example, if I took uh, random hopping in 1D, so no on-site potentials, but just uh, random T1, T2, T3, 
that model has a particle hole symmetry, and it actually has a critical state at zero energy as a result, uh, because the particle hole symmetry takes e to minus e. So even in 1D, those states occur. Um, but I'm basically going to think about MBL in situations where I don't have any special critical state like that, and everything would be localized before I turn on uh, the potential. So even in 1D, there are critical states, and those are very interesting sort of non-interacting critical points. Um, that 1D1 we do understand. In higher dimensions, there are some that we don't understand very well, even though they may be relevant to experiments, like the quantum Hall plateau transition. But uh, I don't think... Basically, I'm going to focus on MBL in the case where the one-particle problem is pretty trivial. Everything's just exponentially localized. Good. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about non-interacting systems, but the general conclusion is that if you don't ask me hard questions about critical states and phase transitions, then we pretty well understand at least the possible phases of non-interacting systems with disorder. Um, and for the simplest symmetries, uh, disorder is either localizing everything or localizing everything except a few isolated states. Uh, and I'm going to talk about 1D, where disorder tends to localize everything. Um, when we add in interactions, then interesting things happen, and that's this many-body localization problem. And that has quite a long history. Many people dated to Anderson in 1958, but then people forgot about interactions for a while, and the modern era began around 2005, 2006. So one reason why people didn't really need to study this combination is if you look at electronic systems, so people have studied Anderson localization in the lab very well for electronic systems, and they've studied interaction corrections to it. But if you go to long enough times, you find that the electronic system in a solid is not really a closed quantum mechanical system. It interacts with the phonons. The phonons give some dephasing, and that sort of cuts off the localization interference. So you ultimately get non-zero conductivity. There are recent claims otherwise, but the general belief is that if you take electrons in a solid and they don't go superconducting, uh, then you'll find that they have a finite conductivity uh, at any non-zero temperature that you can actually measure. It's not truly localized, which would be zero conductivity. Um, but most of the claims to see MBL are actually atomic type systems where there are no phonons because the lattice is made from light waves. Uh, so these are much better as far as closed quantum systems where you can hope to probe MBL. And there are some experiments that may be showing MBL-like features. I'm not going to talk much about experiments because this is ICTS, but uh, it is kind of an active area. So just to say a bit more about uh, how people were able to see localization, there is this interference of trajectories. Maybe it's worthwhile drawing one picture to make this a bit less mysterious. Um, if you haven't seen Anderson localization before, here is one of the experimental or one of the experimental predictions that turned out to be true to confirm that the effect of interference is what we thought. So I'm just going to draw sketches that represent some kind of real space Feynman diagram. So let's say I've got one point A in real space and one point B in real space, and I'm interested in figuring out the probability to get from A to B. So there are various paths that the electron could take. Um, and if B is far away, those paths on a short time propagation, say, will tend to be straight lines. So this would be one path. This would be another path. Uh, if A and B are close together, then the paths that get from A to B will tend to be self-intersecting. Draw it like this. If they're not, in other words, if I'm thinking about, for example, random walks of length n, then if a of, of n steps, then if a and b are n steps apart, the only choice is a straight line, which isn't self-intersecting. If a and b are much closer together than n, then there will be self-intersections. So paths with self-intersections tend to put me farther than paths that don't have self-intersections. Now we have to remember that we're doing quantum mechanics. And remember that when I do my summation of squared amplitudes to get a probability, there's another path that will appear, and it's actually going to be the cross terms between this path and the one that is like it, but reverses time. Whoops, I didn't do that right. 
uh, the one that reverses time around the loop. So let's say I've got another path, which looks very similar, except that now I go around the loop that way. So there will be direct terms. There'll be AA terms. Sorry, sorry. There'll be path one, path one terms, and path two, path two terms, and those are not very interesting. The interesting thing is, uh, if I have this situation, I get a large cross term. These, this is sort of the constructive interference of self-intersecting paths, which favors short distance propagation over long distance propagation. And that's where localization comes from. And how, how could you possibly tell? Well, there's a neat experiment you can do, which is this all depended on time reversal symmetry. It depended on my being able to form a path that, at least for the part going around the loop, was the time reversal conjugate. Suppose I put some magnetic field in here. So in other words, I take my Anderson localized system, which will ultimately have a finite conductivity, because that's the way solids work, and I put a little bit of flux a little bit of magnetic field in the system, then now these no longer uh, will interfere constructively the way the phases work. Uh, now this will get modulated, and by the time I've got of order of flux quantum through that loop, the interference is no longer guaranteed to be constructive. So what that predicts is that the system is actually less localized when I put a magnetic field on, or in other words, it's conductivity will actually increase when I put on a magnetic field. That's not the way normal metals work. In a normal metal, you put on a magnetic field, you bend the electrons, and the conductivity goes down. Here, you put a magnetic field on, and the conductivity goes up. So this is the famous uh, negative magnetoresistance signature that was a sign we did actually understand. And this sort of perturbative theory of Anderson localization is usually known as weak localization. Uh, and it's a whole beautiful theory, but I don't think uh, we have time for it here. But at least this is a fairly convincing experiment that something about constructive interference of short trajectories is what's giving you localization. Okay, moving on. So people had a very uh, successful decade or two understanding weak localization. And now we want to think about effects of interactions uh, beyond the sort of perturbation theory approaches that had been successful for understanding condensed matter experiments. Um, so since this is supposed to be pedagogical, I'll tell you one bit of progress in understanding non-interacting localization. Basically, there are, well, there are 10 different kinds of non-interacting disordered problems of fermions if you don't care about crystalline symmetries, uh, because 3 times 3 is 10. Uh, that's not quite right, which is the point of this slide. Basically, there are two symmetries that we think are still possibly present in materials if I assume that there's disorder, so I don't have any lattice symmetries or things like that. One symmetry is time reversal, which I already mentioned is kind of important. And the other one appears in things like superconductors. There's a kind of chiral symmetry or charge conjugation symmetry. Each of these symmetries has three possible behaviors. So, for example, with time reversal, if I've got something uh, like the Anderson problem of electrons in a real potential, time reversal squares to plus one. If I've got electrons with spin orbit couplings, say, real electrons, time reversal squares to minus one. And if I put on a magnetic field, then time reversal is just not a symmetry. And those three classes are the famous Wigner-Dyson symmetry classes. Uh, I can do the same thing with charge conjugation, and that would give me nine classes because there are three possibilities for the charge conjugation symmetry and three possibilities for the time reversal symmetry. That charge conjugation symmetry, if you want a picture of what that is, if you've ever solved the equations of quasiparticles in a superconductor, you find that there's a symmetry. Every state at plus E has a pair state at minus E. That's a kind of symmetry, and that's an example of this. So the, way, the reason that there are actually 10 classes, and this is now known as the tenfold way, or 10 Altland-Zirnbauer classes, is that you could have that neither C nor T is a symmetry, but you do have symmetry under the product. That's kind of the 10th class. Um, so progress, we actually know for all 10 of those classes, and this is an amazing mathematical physics result that people have derived in various ways, we know all the different topological classes of insulators. In every dimension, there are three 
Z2 classes, sorry, three integer classes and two Z2 classes that process as you change the number of dimensions. That was the one comment I wanted to make about recent progress in non-interacting disordered physics. Uh, okay, so now on to many-body localization so that we can talk about interactions. Um, a way to motivate this connected to the integrability we talked about before is Yang-Baxter integrability means that the Gibbs ensemble is not the right ensemble. If I do thermalize, it's to some kind of generalized Gibbs ensemble. A localized system uh, is maybe a more robust way of keeping something from thermalizing. So if we can show that many body localization exists and systems don't thermalize, and I'll tell you how those are connected in the bottom of the slide, then that's a probably more robust thing because Yang-Baxter models, we think that if we perturb them slightly, we lose the integrability. With MBL, the amazing thing about MBL is that it's a stable form of integrability, where if I change things slightly, I still have just as many conserved quantities. The detailed form of the conserved quantities changes a bit, but there's still uh, just enough for the whole system. So how is localization connected to failure to thermalize? Well, if you've ever taught StatMech, you've probably motivated the Boltzmann factor, this e to the minus beta e, uh, by thinking about system plus bath. And the system can exchange particles and energy with the bath, and that's how you obtain the rule of the most probable configuration, which leads to all of StatMech. So if we've got, if we don't want to have an external bath, the way that probably works in real systems is that one piece of the system can exchange particles and energy with the rest of the system. So the rest of the system, the rest of the material, say, is the bath for one part of the material. That doesn't work if a system is localized, because if we've got particles that are trapped in bound states, say, then if I start off with more particles in one part of the material and fewer particles in another part compared to the thermal expectation, there's no way to spread that out because of the localization. So localization is not compatible with one part of the system seeing the rest as the bath. So the sort of things that people have worked on a lot, you know, how can different sorts of symmetry and interactions and all that control localization? Um, I want to focus on this question, what are the new properties of the localized phase? And let me tell you, uh, you'll see a couple different definitions of MBL that we think are basically equivalent. Uh, the one that I think is most mathematically established is in terms of conserved quantities. But here's another one, because I mentioned entanglement earlier. But, yeah. I guess um, if you have an... Okay, so it, if, your, if your bath is something that forgets, uh, so if it's really a bath and not... So you, you, you could have a situation where the electrons plus phonons together are localized, because that, that is a closed quantum system. But if, if you're treating the phonons we usually, the way we usually treat them, which is some kind of Markovian process, then I think it's hard to have true MBL. So actually, a lot of the work on MBL these days, what we think of as strong MBL is actually very specific to 1D, and it's very specific to not having SU2 or higher symmetry and other caveats. We think that strong MBL, in the sense of an infinite list of conserved quantities, is pretty hard to make. But we think that above 1D, or if you've got a bath or whatever, you can get a kind of weak MBL, where ultimately the system thermalizes, but the time scale is larger than the age of the universe or something. Uh, so in the lab, it's probably localized. It, yeah, you, you could be connected to a bath, but very weakly. And then my belief would be that strong MBL doesn't exist. It's not truly a different phase from diffusive. Well, it, it's just a small difference in principle. And then the cold atom case, you're making the lattice through a different process, which is less likely to dissipate. Uh, because the lattice doesn't, there's no vibrations of the lattice if you want, at least to a pretty good approximation, because the lattice is just made by some laser beams. Uh, so the atomic system is a little bit more closed than the condensed matter system. In the real world of current experiments, they're probably not, I mean, the disadvantage of the atomic system is that they're, they're fairly small and they're only studied for some finite amount of time. In fact, I think a big problem for experiments in this field is consider a classical glass. You know, a classical glass is maybe not frozen. It does flow, as I think Professor Abanov said, but the time scale can be extremely long. So if you were looking at window glass for a day instead of a thousand years, you would not think it flows. You would think it's basically stuck. 
And it could be that a lot of the experimental MBL systems are, are more like a classical glass and that they are actually evolving. It's just very slow uh, because they, yeah, the perfect experiment would be a very large system for a very large time with no bath and they don't really have that. Okay, good. Other questions? So uh, the entanglement picture of MBL is, uh, from what I just said before, if you believe in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then a thermalizing state should have volume law entanglement once I'm at non-zero energy density. Uh, a picture of the MBL state is that it actually is more like a ground state. Uh, it has an area law. And this is, this is actually kind of worked out after some of the numerical stuff, but it, it's a clue that MBL states are probably pretty accessible to things like matrix product state methods because they don't have too much entanglement. But being able to do this for excited states is still tricky. Uh, but some things you can look for, and people have tried these and many other things to look for the MBL transition would be it's where the conductivity goes to zero, it's where you don't thermalize, it's where the entanglement of eigenstates changes. Uh, but that's why people tend to disagree on the finite systems they can study. You know, using these different probes gives you a different clue maybe of where the transition is. So I'm going to focus on deep in the MBL phase mostly, where there's not much ambiguity. Um, and there's only one model, as far as I know, where it's proven in a way that would satisfy a mathematician that MBL exists. And what was actually proven was the existence of an infinite set of local conserved quantities for some range of disorder. And the model was this kind of Ising model with random Ising coupling and random longitudinal and transverse fields. Um, it's a proof by John Imbry, who you might know from branched polymers and things like that in the old days. So that means there's definitely no thermalization, no conventional thermalization, if you can prove the existence of these conserved quantities. I'm going to talk about a random XXZ model where the connection to Anderson localization is easier to make. But this, so this is, in a sense, a kind of integrability, but there's no Yang-Baxter equation. Uh, integrability in the sense that it doesn't thermalize and there are a lot of conserved quantities. But exactly how connected this sort of integrability is to the standard kind, uh, we're still working on. So this is what I mentioned before, that strong MBL in this sense of an infinite number of local conserved quantities, and you'll see what those conserved quantities are like when I talk about XXZ, Strong MBL seems to be pretty specific to 1D, short-range interactions, no high symmetries, etc. But there are plenty of cases where you get something like an increase in the time scale for thermalization. Uh, so quasi-MBL or MBL light or whatever your favorite term is, that seems to happen a lot and maybe that's what's happening in the lab. Okay, so for a model, uh, Let's take XXZ and add a random field. And one reason for doing this, if I think about this in terms of fermions through the jordan Wigner transformation, this is like an interaction between the fermions. This is just fermionic hopping, and this is a random on-site potential for the fermions. So we know that if I turned off the interaction, if I just had JXX and the random field, that's one of the problems that Anderson studied. That's the one-dimensional Anderson localization problem with random on-site potentials, and everything is localized. So we sort of know, and uh, the original work that kind of restarted MBL was by Bosco, Elena, and Alt Schuller, and also by Gorney Merlin and collaborators. Uh, David Hughes and collaborators like Vadim Oganessian made a lot of progress by saying, well, instead of thinking about fermions in the continuum, which is hard and where there may not be true MBL, let's just think about spin chains like this, or equivalently fermion lattice models. Um, and that's the kind of model, uh, the, it's lattice models where we have pretty rigorous statements now. Um, but anyway, the basic idea would be that if I turned off disorder, so delta is the strength of disorder, then I would have extended states and maybe even ballistic physics, like what I talked about before. Uh, if I made disorder really strong, I'd have localization, and what happens in between is kind of a hard question. Um, but we can at least ask, what if I have some interactions in the localized phase, what does that do? Uh, yeah. Um, so by infinite temperature, that just means start with randomly chosen initial states. So it's like temperature in the Kubo formula. It only enters as an initial weight. Uh, so by infinite temperature, I just mean choose random initial states and see what happens. Uh, yeah, It's right that uh, these are systems that if I did not 
coupled to a bath or something, there isn't any, it doesn't reach any thermal state. Uh, so the, this is just to mention the various things that people have tried to look at to understand either the transition or the phases. Um, one thing that you can try that I think I won't get to, uh, I'll talk a little bit about level statistics in the last lecture, but uh, there is a classic difference between integral models and chaotic models in what's called level repulsion. Uh, so that's one thing that people have looked at, and like I said, I'll, I'll tell you more about that later, but it doesn't particularly isolate the transition better than other methods. You can look at correlations, you can look at entanglement, and so on. Um, so what I want to focus on, it turns out we were looking for the transition and we didn't have any anything new to say about that, but we can say something about what the MBL phase is like, basically by accident. And then other people mostly gave an interpretation of what we were seeing that at least works very well. Uh, so that's what I want to summarize. Basically, the idea is going to be that the MBL phase is to Anderson localization like a Fermi liquid is to a Fermi gas. They have the same conservation laws, but the interaction between the conservation laws is different. So let me try to sketch that as we get to it. Um, so I'm going to skip that. And this is the numerical experiment that we started doing, basically because it was doable with numerical methods like DMRG. So I take a random initial state, which is a product state. That has zero entanglement, so that's pretty easy with matrix product states. I evolve it under that Hamiltonian. So this is some kind of quench, if you like. Um, if we have a ballistic phase, or in general, even a diffusive phase, we expect that the entanglement will grow linearly in time. That is, suppose my chain is infinite, and I'm looking at the entanglement across the middle. So A and B are the left half of the system and the right half of the system. That entanglement growing linearly in time is one well-known possibility, or a global quench. Um, another possibility, and I'll show you that this is what happens in Anderson localization, is that entanglement grows for a while, and then it stops. Uh, it stops basically when particles have moved of order the localization length. And then what happens when you add interactions to the localized phase? And uh, it turns out that for the idea that this is kind of an efficiently simulable problem is in this earlier work by Prolovsek. Uh, what we did was try to study interactions in a controlled way, and what we got surprised us. Um, so here's the idea, and then I'll tell you the, the resolution of what's going on here. Um, so the idea is this is entanglement versus time, and time is on a log scale. So this is fairly slow dynamics. And these curves are what happens to the entanglement for different interactions. So the blue is Anderson localization. That is, if I've got no interactions, the entanglement reaches some amount and saturates. And this is averaged over initial conditions and averaged over disorder. If I've got a little bit of interaction, well, if I change the Hamiltonian slightly, then the amount of time it takes for that perturbation to act is long. It goes like 1 over delta H. That's not surprising. So weak interactions take a long time to have an effect, but once they kick in, the entanglement increases basically like log T. And looking at this, uh, whenever I put on interactions, so these are weak enough interactions that we'd think if there is an MBL phase, we're probably still in it. I get a logarithmic in time increase of entanglement entropy, and the coefficient of the log, or the slope, does not seem to depend very much on the interaction strength. In other words, all these curves are roughly the same slope. And these are systems of size 40 or so. It's not hugely larger than what you could do with exact diagonalization. You could pretty much see the same thing with ED if you knew what to look for. So what about more conventional quantities? So I'll tell you later on, if you don't like entanglement, what's another measurement you could do? But if you just looked at conductivities, basically if you look at how this is the variance, I think, of particle number. If you look at things that are intended to probe whether particles and energy are localized, you find that there is no big difference between Anderson localization and the interacting case. So indeed, this still looks like a localized phase, but it looks like entanglement is behaving oddly. There's some very slow dynamics present in entanglement that's not there in charge or energy. Uh, so. I'll come back uh, to this question of what other properties could you measure. There is some laboratory progress in measuring entanglement up to four or eight particles or so. Uh, that's Marcus Greiner's group at Harvard. But it would be better to find other things that are easier to measure, and I'll tell you one in a little bit. But uh, let me first give you the picture of the MBL phase that kind of emerged from this numerical observation. 
uh, which is that you have a kind of dephasing even when you don't delocalize. And I'll sketch that and how it gives the log. But first question. Uh, so this term is the interaction. I realize I never wrote up the fermionic form, but basically this transforms into... So in 1D, fermions and bosons and spins are all transformable. Um, this is like a hopping of the fermion on site I to site I plus 1. So this would be non-interacting metal. So for example, the XX chain, where I just have this term, is exactly equivalent to free fermions. Uh, this looks like n sub i, n sub i plus 1. So this is a nearest neighbor interaction between the fermion densities. Um, well, this is uh, number, it's number conserving. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's not BCS in the sense of, if you mean the superconducting state. Uh, like this is n sub i, n sub i plus 1. This is just like n sub i. Uh, so there's no uh, non-number conserving interaction. Uh, maybe. If I... So this is all in the pretty strongly disordered limit. So I don't think it matters. Um, let me think about that. Uh, so this system is localized, however strong, let's say delta is the magnitude of the H distribution. Uh, however strong delta is compared to JXX, so there's no disorder in JXX, it's always localized. Uh, here, I think if the interaction is stronger than the disorder, then I will get very different behavior. That will push me into the delocalized phase. Yeah, well, we think that a mod insulator at any non-zero temperature does have a tiny bit of conductivity. We think it has some exponentially activated conductivity, but, but I think this is another, this is the kind of question that is challenging for experiment, but at least theoretically that's a different phase that will have some conductivity, uh, and it will, you know, thermalize. Uh, if you take a, for example, a Hubbard model or something that has a mod insulating ground state, uh, but in practice, it could be that it thermalizes so slowly that it looks like an MBL state. Good. The questions? Okay. So here's the picture of the MBL state that kind of emerges. And it, this is not the kind of thing one can prove, but uh, I think it explains the data well. Um, and at least for some long times, it's correct. The idea is, suppose I've got... I'm in the MBL state. Suppose I was, if I was Anderson localized, my states would have a typical localization length, which is what I'm calling psi zero. So if I ask about turning on interactions uh, and the conserved quantities that are going to appear in a little bit uh, are basically just the occupancies of the Anderson localized one particle eigenstates if I didn't have interactions. When I turn on interactions, those change a bit, but they're still if you want a picture of what the conserved quantities are in MBL, for this model, you should think of them as just things that were continuously connected to the Anderson localized eigenstates. They're sometimes called L bits or tau bits in this community. Um, so the effective interaction between two localized states, if they're far apart compared to the localization length, say, it would fall off exponentially in L. So whatever the bare interaction is, let me call that J0. So this, for example, would be that JZ term in the Hamiltonian. Uh, but it will be effectively weak if it's an interaction between the tails of two far apart localized states. So now we make kind of the drastic assumption, which is as we evolve in time, this interaction starts to act. And what it does, well, if it's interacting between, you know, two localized states, each of which can be occupied or empty, the most it can do is make a bit of entanglement. And the time it takes to make that bit of entanglement will be like one over J effective. So if I assume that every pair becomes entangled at a time 1 over j effective and just count for how many pairs is that large enough, uh, I get the following form for the entanglement entropy. It should go like log of j naught t, so it's basically just inverting this formula, times the non-interacting localization length. Uh, so it's got a logarithm of time. The point at which that kicks in is related to 
the strength of interaction, but the slope, once it kicks in, is not related to the interaction for small interaction. It's related to the localization length. And that was the point I tried to mention about the data, that probably the localization length hasn't changed very much because these interactions are weak compared to the hopping and the disorder. But uh, that slope is still basically constant. Maybe it goes as the localization length. So now the, the problem with this argument, uh, I called it a short time assumption. I don't know how you could justify in the long time limit that this is the right value of the entanglement, but at least it captures that logarithmic growth pretty well. Um, and then we got interested in, since entanglement is basically impossible to measure, is there a way you could see that log? And I'll tell you a bit about that to try to convince you that it's more physical. And then I think by the end of this lecture, uh, I should be able to summarize what we understand about the MBL state in the simplest possible picture, which is that it's like the Anderson localized case, except for some interaction between the conservation laws. So that picture is going to break down as we get close to the transition. So I want to stress that what I have to tell you today does not help you analyze the transition. There are efforts to analyze it, but not that we can compare to any numerics or experiment at the moment. So the basic idea of what else is going to be sensitive to this logarithmic time dependence is the following. Uh, if you have a system, even in classical physics, there's an idea of a recurrence or a revival. Um, so I think Poincaré showed that if you have a finite phase space of a Hamiltonian system, then eventually you come back arbitrarily close to where you started. And how long you take for a given distance from where you started is basically a measurement of the volume of phase space. So the way we can look at that in quantum mechanics is how long it takes for some observable chosen properly to come back close to its original value. Well, coming back close to its original value is going to depend on several frequencies being in sync. And how many frequencies have to be in sync? Well, that's what this revival rate probes. And that changes a lot between Anderson localization and MBL uh, for effectively the same reason as this, but in disguise. Um, so here was the question that we thought about, and uh, I think I lost the reference. There's a paper by Saro Fazio and others that introduced this model several years earlier for other reasons. It's basically take that random XX chain and tack on one spin at the end, which is just kind of a probe. So that spin at the end, its only dynamics is this with the end of the chain, and then the bulk of the system is just the same XXL system, XXZ system thought to be in the localized phase. So the question we're going to ask, which we hope is reasonably experimental, is just, if I started with this boundary spin being up, how often does it come back to being up, or say 95% of up? Yes? Ah, yeah, that, okay, so that's the correlation length of a critical state, that's true. Uh, but I think here we're very far from any notion of criticality or something like that. So here, um, these are not particularly large bond dimensions, and the entanglement is always pretty small. Uh, so, for example, at, at least for the, you know, for what we're accessing, the entanglement is, you know, less than one bit even on average. Uh, so it's it's different from the conformal field theory type scaling, I think. Um, Well, you, I mean the localization length, which in the non-interacting case shows up in all kinds of observables. It's basically just, uh, so in the non-interacting system, the ground state, say, is a Slater determinant of a bunch of one-particle orbitals. I just mean how big are those orbitals? Um, so, for example, uh, what happens as you get close to special points with power laws is that the localization length diverges. In this 1D model with on-site disorder, there is no divergence of that type. There's just a localization length, which would get longer if I made the disorder weaker, but we're deliberately putting disorder, we're making disorder quite strong so that all the physics is local and that 40 sites are enough to see what's going on. Um, so maybe I'll be a little bit quick here because I think I have eight minutes. Uh, you can look at the probe, first of all, to try to figure out when is the system localized versus not localized. When it's not localized, you kind of expect that the probe never comes back. Um, here is maybe the figure that I want to focus on, because this is kind of the direct measurement of the logarithmic dynamics. Uh, 
So let me explain what's going on here. So suppose that I wait a time t and evolve my system and ask how many times has my probe spin come back to 95%, say, of its original value. Uh, if I don't have interactions, then that revival rate, well, it basically saturates to something uh, that is the rate of revivals per time. Um, so if you're wondering why does it change at all, well, initially I knew that the system was up and it started to evolve and there's kind of a repulsion effect or something at small times, but eventually it saturates to a value uh, because basically there's some finite number of frequencies that I'm coupled to, uh, which are the energy differences of the localized states, and this is set by how often do those come into sync and put me back near where I started. So if I turn on a little bit of interaction, then something interesting happens, which is that the interaction basically makes more frequencies appear. Because now, I don't just have frequency differences of the localized states, I've got new energy magnitudes that have to be in sync, like the interaction terms. And once those kick in, the revival rate starts to die, and it never really saturates. I get fewer and fewer revivals as time goes by, because basically as time goes by, more clocks need to be in sync. Um, and you can make sort of a scaling theory of that, um, and prove that you get a logarithm, and you can collapse onto the logarithm. It's the same logarithm that I talked about before. Uh, sorry for having to rush through this a little bit, but uh, at least deep in the MBL phase, um, you can collapse this all, that's what the inset is showing, and argue that what's going on in the MBL phase is basically that the interactions between the localized states are giving you new frequencies, and the rate at which that's happening gives you lots of logarithmic time dependence, and that's true, and if you remember what was happening in the entanglement case, that's true here as well, that the interaction between the localized states gives me new energy scales, those new energy scales are usually small because this exponential, uh, but it's sort of the proliferation of new energy scales that gives me a lot of dephasing, but I never, it's never strong enough to delocalize, at least not on any time scale that we can observe, and if we believe the Imbri proof would also apply to this model, which no one has done, then it would never delocalize. Uh, Um, yeah, you should be able to connect in the middle of the chain. I don't think we ever did it, but I think that is possible. I don't... Well, it, it is a closed system of one... So it's important that the probe is not like a Lindblad operator or something. It's just one quantum spin, and the, it's a full closed... So I'd say that the MBL is part of the system, if you want. I mean, sorry, the probe spin is part of the closed system. So it, it can't really... It doesn't have enough degrees of freedom to thermalize unless you had something dissipative, like a Lindblad process, which we don't. Um, well, let's see. I mean, I, I know in a, there are these effects in a two-dimensional system, the boundary is enough to delocalize, which has a lot of spins. I'm not sure if I know that, I'm not sure if I buy that one spin is enough to completely delocalize. Uh, but maybe you can tell me after. Um, so the conclusion that I wanted to get to and to try to say in a few words is the picture of the MBL phase deep in the MBL phase is actually very simple. And if you remember what a Fermi liquid is in the original sort of landau silen simplest version of a Fermi liquid, the Hamiltonian looks the same, except it's not momentum space, it's real space. Uh, so the idea of the Fermi liquid is that n sub k, the occupancy at a particular momentum, is still a well-defined number, but the different n sub k's interact with each other. That was at least the original idea of what a Fermi liquid was. So here, in MBL, uh, we still have conserved quantities, which, for this problem, uh, if I turned off interactions, then the Hamiltonian would just look like occupancies of some orbitals. Those would be the Anderson localized orbitals with some energies. The effect of interactions deep in the MBL phase is that I still have just as many conserved quantities, so these n sub i's commute with the Hamiltonians, but I have some weak interactions between them. They're at least weak. They fall off exponentially as these things move apart because of the exponential localization of the orbitals. Um, so because I've got all these weak extra terms, 
it was really the analysis of this that gave me both the logarithmic growth of entanglement and the log collapse of the revival rate. Uh, but the, end, the picture at the end of the day is almost embarrassingly simple. That deep in the MBL phase, the first thing you add is this term. Presumably, as you get closer to the transition, you should think about three body and so on. You should basically think about all the terms that you're allowed that still have the n sub i as conserved quantities. And it's important, these are not really occupancies on one particular site or something. These evolve as I turn on the interactions, but they still should have that localized aspect. Um, so that's deep in the MBL phase, but because we don't know how to handle the dots in a controlled way, this presumably gets a lot more complicated close to the transition. Um, but the good news is there's at least one clear difference between MBL and Anderson, which is the slow time dynamics. Um, and there are a few things we don't understand that maybe I'll, I'll, well, there are a lot of things we don't understand, but a few that are directly connected to what's in this talk. So I wanted to put one slide up, which was related to a question I got yesterday about, uh, actually, a, a, co a conversation after the talk. Uh, what is GGE like for MBL? So MBL, we've just said we have an infinite number of conservation laws. The form of the conservation laws is, is very different, though, because in something like a Yang-Baxter system, the conservation laws are sums of local densities. So, for example, the spin, the total spin is a conserved quantity, and it's a sum of the local spin operators. And that means that its eigenvalues are very large in magnitude because it's some infinite sum, etc. Here, the conservation laws are just whether a particular state is occupied or not in the Anderson localized case. And we expect that even as we turn up interactions, they would still in this case be something with just two eigenvalues, zero or one. Uh, so they're more local and they're smaller operators in operator norm. Um, and the consequences of that, I don't think we fully understand. And in particular, I don't know how to use, I don't know whether there is a convergence to a GGE in terms of those operators, maybe in some cases there isn't, definitely, and then therefore I don't really know how to calculate what is the long time dynamics of a finite block. So just to show you an example of where we can compute quantum quench things in integral models but not yet in MBL, suppose I took that entanglement growth experiment and looked at one finite block. So if I'm looking at the infinite system, I keep seeing that logarithmic growth. If I look at one finite block, eventually things stop growing. And there is a pretty well-defined final state in the following sense. If I took no interactions, then the final state I get from a quench is area law. If I have interactions, even though the individual eigenstates are area law, the final state that I reach by evolving a product state is not area law, it's volume law. And the coefficient of the volume law, well, I don't know how to think about that as anything thermal because the system is not thermalizing, um, but it has a final volume law, and that final volume law is pretty independent of what the interactions were to get there. So a guess might be maybe this is the volume law consistent with some kind of restricted Gibbs ensemble where local number and energy are not allowed to fluctuate because those can't move around, but that's just a conjecture. We know that there is some kind of well-defined final state that a local block reaches after a quench, uh, but not how to compute it. Um, so there are plenty of other things about the transition and so on that we don't understand, but this is something that even deep in the MBL phase, um, that's saying that individual eigenstates are area law, the final state after a quench is volume law, but what determines the coefficient of that volume law, it would be great if someone had a recipe or a picture, but I don't. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to say about MBL, and I'm already a minute over, so let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, before we start with the question, I have uh, an announcement from the organizers. Tomorrow at 11, after Sasha's talk, there will be a travel agent to organize uh, your activity for the weekend. OK. I, I, I have some clarifying question about this real space uh, Fermi liquid picture. Uh, so if we're talking about momentum space, the great deal of efforts was to show that the scattering between different k's is irrelevant because of the real surface in the in the wave in the phase space. So, so what about what what what's the analog of this here? So why I think the only case where the equivalent work has been done? So what Imbri did was take his Hamiltonian a different one. Uh, so let me go back to that Ising type thing. 
So he basically did the work of showing that the conserved quantities are stable. Okay, so to be precise, uh, let's say there are simple limits of this where I can write down conserved quantities, like if all these are constant or something. Then to show that as I ramp up disorder, there's some finite radius of disorder strengths over which there still exists just as many conserved quantities that compute that commute with the Hamiltonian. So if you want what Landau and others did was show that um, all the terms that don't respect NK, you know, all the additional interactions you could add are not, are irrelevant uh, at low temperature. So here it's not really a relevance argument, it's showing that those terms are just not there if you choose the conserved quantities the right way. But the, I guess that is a spiritual difference in that in the Landau case, the n sub k operators are fixed. Those are not evolving as I turn on the interaction. And only close to Fermi surface, right? It's, it's, yeah. So that's so there is no such thing as kinematic origin of this. As, as in. Um, well, I mean, here, it, okay, it's not it's not a statement about close to the Fermi surface. Uh, and the, here, the conserved quantities are believed to be exactly commuting, but it's only over some, if you want, some range of the parameters. Like, for example, he can't prove that MBL exists for any disorder strength and so on, there has to be some minimal disorder strength in order to get, like, I guess, okay, so if I, if I turned off this term, then these would clearly uh, give me a, a localized Hamiltonian because I would just point along the local field at every site. So the, the aspect of the proof is to prove that even as I start to couple, uh, there remain just as many conserved quantities that exactly commute with the Hamiltonian. So that is the equivalent of the kinematics, I guess. It's the, you know, this is an interaction between the spins that were the conserved quantities in real space. Uh, but in a way, it's stronger than the Fermi liquid case, because the Fermi liquid case, you don't exactly prove that the n sub k's commute with the Hamiltonian. You say that the terms where they don't commute don't matter at low energy. Uh, yeah. Is that that? So I imagine I don't know anything about physics. I just see your last equation as Hamiltonian, okay? So this is, uh, I would say, completely classic Hamiltonian. There is nothing quantum, right? Because everything commutes with anything else. Any operator you are putting is, is classic. So what is about? I mean, what is the fuss about? Uh, the thing is, you might put in initial states that are not... A generic initial state that you produce will not be in eigenstates of these n. I mean, it, it, that's right. If, if you can put in states that are in eigenstates of these conserved quantities, then dynamics is trivial. But I think that's no different from any other integrable model. Like, suppose I gave you a solution of x, x, z or something. Uh, if you put in things that had well-defined values of the conserved quantities, then the dynamics is not so exciting. I guess where things really get interesting is when you put in some super, something that's a superposition of different values that conserve quantities. I think that's true here as well. So I guess it, 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 if you, this is if you want, you solve the problem in one basis and all the interesting dynamics comes because the basis that we normally think about, like the electron, is not the quantity that we solve in terms of. So in that way, it's kind of like other integral models, I think. I mean, the big difference between this and other integral models is that somehow well, first of all, you don't have any of that beautiful Yang-Baxter structure and things like that. Uh, but on the other hand, here, as you change the strength of disorder or other parameters, uh, the conserved quantities evolve, but they don't disappear. While in Yang-Baxter, the general belief is that, at least for some perturbations, they disappear. Uh, there's no stability. Sierra? integrability of an MBL? And well, I think that's what happens at the transition. Yeah, at the transition, these stop. You no longer have as many commuting operators. So, but is there, for example, yesterday you were showing very nice quench dynamics that you can do close to the, uh, around the integrability breaking point. So, is there a qualitative calculation that you can do similar in the transition region? like? Uh, no, I mean, there we can do calculations in the integral model very well, but I think if you want here a challenge, there's this great insight that was really made rigorous by Imbri that 
the way to think about an MBL system, at least in 1D, is having this complete list of conserved quantities that are local. Using that to actually calculate things has not so far, as, as far as I know, been as successful as in Yang-Baxter. Uh, I mean, it, it shows you that the phase exists, but for example, his proof is a lot of hard analysis estimates. It's not like there's an algebraic structure or something that would be very useful for other calculations. So, I mean, he, the existence of conserved quantities lets you make a model for that log t dynamics and things like that, so it's certainly important, but uh, so far, I haven't seen it being used for things like propagation of a wave packet and stuff like that, like what I talked about before. Like operator spreading, has that been calculated in um, integrability breaking type systems? Yeah. Uh, some things are known, but I think it's hard. To... Okay. I, I... Let's see. There are some limits that we understand well. We understand the Anderson localized limit. We understand that the random unitary model is probably the, one, the best understood case of something that's totally thermalizing. Um, but I think, for example, if you want to, something that we definitely don't understand, what goes on at the MBL transition, you should get probably something critical, you know, something between thermalizing and not, and I don't think we have any idea of what the right scaling exponents and things like that are. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of work left to do. But, but, is there any kind of classical analog of these MBLs? I mean, this is a purely quantum mechanical course. Uh, um, probably Do we think about some integrable systems at Alluvial, uh, which don't remain integrable if you do some perturbation, but some classical models which have, I don't know, calm theories or whatever. Well, I, I mean, the one that I would think about a different class, which is just uh, Anderson localization is not really a quantum phenomenon, it's just a wave phenomenon. So if you've got sound waves, in fact, I think sometimes you can design a damper trying to localize sound waves. Um, so I think in general, uh, if you took a localized system by disorder, which happens in a lot of wave type systems, even if they're classical waves, or you can do it with photons as well, and then you added interactions, I think that would be similar physics. Uh, so I think it's, if you wanted something about the interactions between randomly scattered waves, uh, I don't know how much more quantum mechanics you need than that. Uh, and, but I, I, what I don't know, if I took Systems with a Yang-Baxter equation, I mean, they often have like one parameter, or I can have a multi-parameter family of integral models, that's certainly true, but usually, at least when I'm thinking about a concrete Hamiltonian in space, there's some perturbation that will destroy it. Uh, so I, I don't know about the example you mentioned, whether uh, there's some way to stabilize that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Taking Alt Schuller's point of view, isn't it the point that a Betty Ansat integrable model is uh, localized in this parameter space in which you have a conservation uh, of these local charges in this funny space? While instead, for um, many body localized state, you start from localization in real space, and this is what we care more about. Yeah, I mean. And therefore, also the perturbation is more natural in one sense because it, you can build it in a more local way in one picture than in the other. I, I, I've heard words like that, and he also likes to talk about uh, many body localization is like Anderson localization in Fox space. I don't know that I'm totally convinced by all of those things. And that, for example, you know, if it, if it were just like one is real space, and one, so, okay, so here, you know, I, I did make it look like something that we know in momentum space, but now in real space. But for example, there's no real space analog of something like the Yang-Baxter equation here. So I think there are, there is some fundamental difference, not just a Fourier transform between Yang-Baxter and MBL. And likewise, I don't think MBL is just Anderson localization on a more complicated space. I mean, that may be true formally, but it doesn't lead you to useful predictions about the original physical Hilbert space so far. Uh, so there's my skeptical answer, I guess. So I guess we eaten enough time from the coffee break, so let's meet still at four, and let's thank Joel once more.